Well, you know, I, I'm noticing the time. We've been talking for just about an hour. I hope you have more time. Uh, I've got as I'd much like... time as you need. I've great. That's great. That's great. Need. What I usually do is I put an hour out for the public and then put another hour uh, up for patrons. In your case, what I'd like to do is do that, but then in, in a week after that, release the second half too, because I think this is a really interesting conversation that everybody should hear, but I'll, I'll probably do that. So starting from this point though, we'll this, I'll put a break here and the second half for the first time it's when it's released originally will be for patrons because this is the part that matters. This is the part <laughs> about Trotsky. I mean, it's not the only part that matters. All of it matters, but this is where we're getting into the, to the meat. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Brian D. Palmer teaches in the Department of History at Queen's University. He edits the journal Labor, and he is the author of James P. Cannon and the Emergence of Trotskyism in the United States, 1928 through 38. Uh, Brian, welcome to the Diet Soap podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I want to start by asking you uh, kind of a personal question. Do you consider yourself to be part of the Trotskyist tradition? Are you a member of a Trotskyist organization? Is that what brought you to write about James P. Cannon? Well, um, I, do, I do consider myself part of a, the Trotskyist tradition. Um and I have had affiliations in the past, but I, I am no longer affiliated with any uh, organized uh, political tendency. Um, like a lot of people who are attracted to or uh, uh, consider themselves Trotskyists, uh, I'm kind of floating at the moment, um, mm -hmm. hoping for some kind of regroupment on the revolutionary left that one can attach oneself to, but I don't see anything uh, right there, right now, uh, that uh, um, has either the the staying power uh, or the uh, um, the sort of uh, programmatic force that would, you know, draw me into it. Um, doesn't mean that, however, that I've relinquished Trotskyist ideas or uh, a sense of the importance of them in the current moment. Yeah. Um I've noticed in the last few years, since around 2016, that many um, sectarian or organizations have fallen away. Uh, people have kind of funneled into the DSA from a variety of tendencies, whether Trotskyist or Maoist or Marxist-Leninist. Um, a lot of entryism went went on uh, in the last few years. D did you you didn't leave your organization that recently, or, or when did you? Leave. No, I left. I left largely uh, uh, in the '80s, um, and essentially for personal reasons, just going mm. through um, some, you know, issues of my own that didn't allow me to devote um, the time or, or or put a monopoly of time on on that. Um, so uh, I I've been a an independent leftist, I guess you would describe me as, uh, um, over the course of the last. Uh, few decades, but um, with obviously an interest in Trotskyism. Well, I want to start by asking you, I want to get to James P. Cannon and your book and the significance of, of the American Trotskyist uh, tradition. But, but before I do, I want to ask you some real basic questions. For instance, um, how should Marxists today understand who Trotsky was, uh, the purging of Trotsky, and and his legacy, do you think? Well, I think the way that Marxists should look on Trotsky today is uh, is that he he represented uh, um, you know the the sort of pinnacle of achievements of the revolutionary working class 
in the era of uh, you know mass upheaval associated with World War One and the Russian Revolution. Uh, mm -hmm. Next to Lenin, he was probably the most important uh, figure in the Russian Revolution. Um, he led the Red Army. Um, he played a fundamental role. Uh, and in the early history of, you know, the revolutionary uh, um, uh, attempts to uh, uh, build a, a, a workers' republic in the, in the Soviet Union, he played a fundamental role. Um, he then, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, was increasingly marginalized as Stalin emerged in the mid uh, to late 1920s. Uh, as the sort of autocratic uh, force uh, within the communist international, the common term. Um, and Trotsky uh, um, played a role in creating a, a left opposition to Stalin in that period, but was ousted by Stalin and eventually assassinated by, by Stalinist agents in Mexico in 1940. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, was driven really uh, around the globe. Uh, he, he called the last chapter of his autobiography, My Life, he called it uh, Planet Without a Visa, um, which was, you know, his, his expression of the difficulty he had in sort of uh, um, uh, negotiating uh, 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 basically a place to locate himself uh, and carry on his revolutionary work. Beyond this, I think what Trotsky is, for anyone seriously confronting uh, you know, being a socialist in the modern period uh, and living with the legacy of the uh, degeneration of the Russian Revolution and the rise of Stalinism, which has played a fundamental role in souring uh, the sort of possibility of the taste of socialism in the mouths of millions, millions mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. What Trotsky accomplished was as the, 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 the really the, the last and best surviving member of that Bolshevik generation that made the Russian Revolution in 1917, he alone created uh, an analysis of the revolution betrayed. Uh, the mm -hmm. title of the book that, that, was, that was first published in English in 1937. Uh, he put forward a, you know, a view of what Stalinism was um, that extended beyond the kind of liberal critique of uh, a totalitarian uh, element within the socialist mm -hmm. movement. Instead, he looked to the way in which uh, um, Stalin uh, not just created a, a caste that, uh, you know, an administrative and bureaucratic caste that sat atop and degenerated the Russian Revolution, but he looked to the way in which uh, Stalin articulated a programmatic conception of what revolution could and should be in the late 1920s that stood antithetical to the program of international proletarian revolution that Trotsky mm -hmm. and Lenin had advocated. Um, and that, that for a variety of reasons that Trotsky um, called permanent revolution. Um, but really what, what Stalin's contribution was, a very negative contribution, was to move the agenda away from an understanding that it would take world and global revolution, built, of course, in individual countries, but extending throughout the world, uh, if socialism was was to be uh, um, was to be successful. And instead, Stalin Stalin uh, sitting atop the caste of uh, the bureaucracy that you know he fomented in you know in in the Soviet Union, uh, instead turned to the notion of socialism in one country, which meant that the revolution which had been made by the Bolsheviks and the working class in 1917, was now dedicated under Stalin's leadership and his leadership of the common turn to uh, sustaining that revolution inside the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And this meant trading off revolutionary aspirations and developments in other parts of the world in order to basically shore up the Soviet bureaucracy and the, uh, under the reign of Stalin. And so this was a recipe, in effect, for the suffocation of the revolution. It took a long time, mm -hmm. but that is, in fact, what we've seen unfold over the course of uh, the 20th century, uh, a process initiated 
in some senses by Stalin, conditioned by a whole series of circumstances, including the, you know, the, the entrenchment of the capitalist nations of the world against uh, the Soviet Union and the attempts to basically limit, sustain, uh, and basically strangle the revolution. Um, but Stalin made his own contribution to that with his shift away from the notion that revolutionaries first and foremost must be involved in not just building the revolution in their own country, but simultaneously extending the revolution globally so that it could survive uh, and in fact defeat capitalism, which has always been a global and world system as socialism indeed must ultimately be as well. And I think that's Trotsky's living legacy to be the red thread of continuity of that Bolshevik achievement of 1917, but with the understanding that it was world revolution that was necessary and not simply uh, the building up of socialism in one country. That that critique from the liberals that the problem with Stalinism was that it was totalitarian is, it, from my way of thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's really the opposite of what Trotsky would say about Stalin because – the in like the realm of philosophy, someone like Hegel might be called a totalitarian because he has a a total, totalizing system, a theory of history that treats uh, human life as a totality. Um, and Marx might be called a totalitarian because he critiques the totality of capitalist relations um, and wants to get beyond the totality. Um, whereas what you just said, I think, was that um, Stalin. Uh, abandon the ambition of creating a, 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 an alternative society on an inter international basis, an alternative to capitalist relations. So in a sense, he, he was not totalitarian. He was uh, humble in his ambition to have something he called socialism in, in one country. Would you say that that's a fair way to understand the liberal critique? I mean, I think that, I think it's a part of it. I think Equally important is the notion that it is very easy for liberals to exalt the, uh, um, the positive features and accomplishments of bourgeois democracy and capitalism mm -hmm. and compare that to societies where um, uh, uh, the rule of law, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the facade of bourgeois democracy, if you will, uh, seems to have fallen as aside. They therefore, liberals, were very happy to point um, to, to Stalin and basically say, well, he's the same as Hitler. These are totalitarian mm. regimes that suppress liberty, uh, that uh, jettison the rights of the individual, and, the, and that create this oppressive collectivism. Um, and, and they pointed to... Uh, um, you know, some admittedly atrocious things that Stalin did, uh, mm -hmm. including the purge trials, uh, including, you know, enforced famine, uh, including a whole series of things, which are, which are very, very ugly. Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, the gulag is the same as the concentration camp. These are totalitarian societies, bourgeois mm -hmm. democracy, much superior. And we, we, you know, and we uh, so um, so in that word totalitarian, there's also the critique of the authoritarian, anti-democratic uh, component of of Stalinism. Not just the fact that it, it has a totalizing vision or wants to replace a absolutely a, a yes. yeah. And what Trotsky would say that misses um, is the uh, is the extent to which uh, um, uh, Stalin. Uh, totalitarian aspects, um, the sort of anti-democratic aspects were in fact, while uh, ugly and certainly something that needed to be opposed, it ultimately paled in importance before Stalin's uh, jettisoning of the revolutionary possibility that the early Bolsheviks had embraced of creating not just a revolution uh, in the Soviet Union, but in creating, you know, a revolutionary possibility on a global and world scale. In sacrificing that, Stalin basically 
um, conceded to capital, the rest of the world, uh, mm -hmm. and in fact set the revolutionary movement back, for instance, in China in 1926, 27, mm -hmm. by you know, basically sacrificing the interests of the Chinese Revolution to the interests of the Soviet Union. Uh, he in fact, you know, created a situation in which a revolution uh, was uh, delayed in China for decades, and uh, a revolution, therefore, that that didn't fulfill its 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 promise and its possibility. So, on the grand historic scale, I think what Trotsky would say is, as terrible as the crimes of Stalin were, in an anti-democratic sense, the crime that he committed against socialist possibility and the realization of world revolution, much much greater. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I've been learning over time is about the uh, nature of the bourgeois revolutions that, you know, the, the 18th, late 18th and 19th century and how there's a continuity between the bourgeois revolutions and socialism. Um, so uh, when you think about when I think about the Russian Revolution, I think of it as something that was going on in the context of a struggle for revolution in Europe. You know, in Germany and Italy and around the world, um, and, and also that had come out of 1848. Uh, there was a, you know, that's when the Communist Manifesto was was written. Um, so the and the, and the other the kind of flip side of that is that the bourgeois revolution is and the kind of uh, national republics that we take for granted. I mean, it, I think it, it that didn't even get fully completed. Until after World War II, there were many parts of even Europe that weren't fully nationalized. They hadn't overturned their the aristocracy completely until after World War II. Is that right? Because should we understand socialism? Do you think as a as like the completion of what had started out as a bourgeois republicanism um, in Europe? Well, I I think that's that is absolutely clear that socialism is in fact the realization ultimately of the bourgeois democratic revolution in the sense that it extends the rights of bourgeois democracy, um, which, uh, you know, capitalism and its nation states, you know, forged in the countenance of bourgeois democracy, always claimed that they had realized, but never did. Mm -hmm. They never did right. realize, you know, the equality of the person. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it, it's intrins intrinsically uh, and inherently oppositional to capital's interests, right? To have everyone mm -hmm. equal. Um, socialism in, and, and the creation of, 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 of you know, the, the ultimate communi communist uh, society is in effect that realization, that extension. It's taking uh, um, those bourgeois democratic rights and the rights of the individual uh and it's placing them uh beyond the reach of capitals uh you know encroachments and containments so i think that's right and i think that there are you know whole sections of the world today that still have not gone through bourgeois democratic revolutions even though they exist within a capitalist uh, global order right um so let's talk about james buchanan because he um, was a socialist. He didn't just emerge after the Russian Revolution. He was a, an American socialist um, and should be understood in, in that context as someone who was part of an indigenous socialist movement, you know, a con continuity or continuation of the American Revolution in a way, and yet uh, who was obviously influenced by what happened in in uh, in Europe and in Russia and the formation of Soviet Union. So I guess what I want to start with, with James Buchanan is, uh, how did he begin as a, as a socialist and, you know, what was the socialist, uh, what the SPA, the socialist party of America and, and how, how would you c conceive of them and that beginning, uh, socialist movement in America? Well, one reason I was attracted to Cannon is because I think he represents uh, really the best of the American revolutionary tradition. Mm -hmm. And he is he is very much a native son, if you want to call him that, although he's he is only a, a second generation 
uh, American. His parents were first generation Irish uh, immigrants to the United States in the late 19th century. And he's born in the Midwest uh, in a, an industrial uh, suburb of Kansas City, Kansas, a uh, place called Rosedale, Kansas. Um, grew up uh, poor, um, but uh, um, uh, really educated in some senses by his father, who was an Irish uh, Republican uh, and a socialist who was attracted to Eugene Debs, who was the long-standing uh, American leader of the uh, uh, of the American socialist movement. And by the time that Cannon was uh, uh, really 16, about 16, uh, and he had been forced to drop out of uh, school for lack of funds in the family, um, he was uh, attracted to labor defense campaigns of uh, um, militants who'd been uh, arrested and faced, uh, you know, uh, trials of various kinds. People like William D. Haywood, who was the leader of the industrial workers of the world. Uh, at 16, Cannon was involved in a labor defense campaign uh, for him. He read the socialist newspapers like the Appeal to Reason, which came out of uh, um, Wichita, uh, and he read uh, and educated himself uh, through reading um, the publications of the Charles H. Kerr Company, which was a, an American radical publisher based in Chicago. Um, from that point on, he did gravitate to the Socialist Party and joined the Socialist Party um, uh, shortly after his labor defense activities. Um, but he found the Socialist Party, as did many, uh, drawn to the possibilities of an American revolution, to be a, a rather tepid uh, organization and, to, and, and perhaps uh, too uh, um, uh, enamored of um, electoral possibilities at the local level. Um, Cannon thirsted for uh, really some, a class struggle uh, kind of orientation and for active militant involvement uh, in working class campaigns. And he joined uh, the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, uh, in 1911, and it's from that date that he really uh, started to conceive of himself as an American revolutionary. Uh, and he moved through uh, the ranks quickly uh, of the IWW. He became a, a soapbox agitator and a kind of itinerant organizer. Uh, he was sent out by Vincent St. John, who was a leader of the IWW in Chicago, to various uh, um, uh, uh, points of uh, sort of class struggle activism. He helped lead a strike in Akron, in Akron, Ohio, of rubber workers. Uh, he was arrested and jailed in a free speech fight in Peoria, Illinois. Um, he traveled to Duluth, Minnesota, where he worked with Frank Little, uh, a, uh, um, uh, uh, an IWW organizer who was part Cherokee uh, and was later uh, executed by vigilantes. Um, and during World War I, uh, however, he saw the pitfall, uh, in some senses, the shortcomings of the industrial workers of the world on two levels. One, in the midst of massive state repression of the IWW, he thought the, the, the industrial workers of the world lacked an appreciation of the state and its repressive capacities. Um, so enamored were they of the struggle at the point of production that they, in some senses, step back from uh, the politics of, of, of class struggle and the political necessity of political struggles. He also saw during World War I that the IWW lacked an approach to war, really lacked mm -hmm. an understanding of war as central to uh, um, capitalist development uh, and to uh, the way in which capitalism was reconfiguring the globe in an age of imperialism. And you put all that together with the happening of the Russian Revolution in 1917 and the way in which that brought to the American working class uh, theoretical uh, um, uh, sort of sophistications that had not previously existed really. Um, the only marks that Cannon and other American revolutionaries read prior to the Russian Revolution were pamphlets like Wage, Labor, and Capital. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, but Lenin brought and Lenin's pamphlets brought 
new understandings, the state and revolution, left-wing communism and infantile disorder, these pushed Cannon into a realization uh, that one needed a political perspective and an international and theoretical understanding as well. And at that point, he moved back into the left wing of the Socialist Party, where the Socialist Party was fragmenting, really, in the time of the Russian Revolution and, and World War I around left and right segments. Uh, and he worked with people like John Reed uh, mm -hmm. in uh, the left wing of the Socialist Party. And from there, he moved into the underground uh, of the communist movement, uh, the beginnings of uh, uh, groups that were affiliated and, and moved to the left of the Socialist Party and thought that a communist, uh, um, uh, that, com that a communist party uh, and affiliation with the Communist International and the Russian revolutionaries was central. Um, so that's, well, that's the background, really. Yeah, let me ask you the question about politics here. Um, so it begins with him leaving the SPA, the Socialist Party of America, to join in the more direct struggle that the IDWW was waging or with the, with workers, right? They're not, not satisfied with local trying to win local elections and play nice with the, the capitalist order, the way the SPA was, he wants to get directly involved in the struggle for workers rights and power. Is that, yes. yeah. But then in the IWW, he <laughs> notices that that, that kind of economism uh, or worker orientation of the WW, the 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 thought that the point of production is where the struggle should take place, wasn't adequate because, you know, you had the state that would come in and on the side of the bosses, and smash you, basically, and that you needed to get political power, in order to succeed even at in your struggles at the point of production. But did that push him to return to electoralism? It sounds like it didn't. It sounds like it pushed him to become some sort of uh, militant revolutionary instead going underground, joining the communist uh, wing of the SPA, following in the footsteps of Rosa Luxemburg, maybe, uh, uh, as, as she split with the Social Democrats in Germany. Is that all a fair characterization? Well, I think, I think it's fair in the sense that uh, um, uh, what Cannon was going through was an evolution. I mean, this is a very young man, after all. I mean, he's right. 21 in 1911. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, between 1911 and 1919, 1920, he moves from uh, basically being a revolutionary syndicalist uh, mm -hmm. with, a socialist, uh, with socialist aspirations to realizing that the IWW, and he never, he never, uh, um, really, uh, um, uh, um, he never really shed his attraction for the militant class struggle uh, orientation of the IWW. Mm -hmm. What he did, he, he always conceived of himself as, quote, a wobbly who learned something. Mm -hmm. it, and it, was the, it was the Russian Revolution, and it was war, and it was the realization that as advanced a movement as the Wobblies were, and they were in terms of the American uh, radical tradition. They were the cutting edge of it in this, in this you know, pre-World War I period. Mm -hmm. As advanced as they were, they still needed to learn something from these international developments like war and revolution. And they needed to learn something about confronting the state and state power if they actually wanted to build uh, you know, the new society in the shell of the old. They had to realize how resilient that shell was. And part of that was state power. Um, mm. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, when he went back into the Socialist Party, he went back into its left wing as a conscious left winger. Mm. I mean, he went back into a faction of the Socialist Party, not the Socialist Party as a whole. He was never attracted to what some called the uh, gas and water socialism of some of the more right-wing elements in the Socialist Party. And it didn't take long uh, for that uh, um, fracturing of the right and the left of the Socialist Party to take place. And what Canada was the gas and water wing? What, was, what were they focused on? Well, they were focused on, for instance, attaining municipal power in, 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 in uh, places like Wisconsin. 
led by Victor Berger, who was uh, a German immigrant, who was a, a, a central player in uh, sort of Milwaukee politics. And, and, these, and these kinds of, of socialists were, were dotted around the uh, landscape uh, of, uh, you know, American politics. Uh, and really, uh, they were what they wanted to do was create uh, a capitalism more palatable uh, um, to uh, workers and uh, to the poor than, ha- than, than was really possible in the kind of 19th century freewheeling capitalist frontier. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, they wanted to get elected to local uh, uh, um, uh, civic in, in local civic politics. Uh, they wanted to create uh, better conditions. Hence, you know, uh, street lights, uh, uh, you know, sewage uh, uh, systems, uh, public transit, um, laudatory, laudatory endeavors in many ways, mm-hmm. but none that really challenged capitalism uh, and none that really confronted um, the kinds of questions that the Russian Revolution and World War I posed. Uh, in terms of class power. Uh, you know. It sounds like they believe that the state could be taken up as an instrument of the working class to get their needs met. Yes, you uh, could elect enough socialists and the state would become yours. Right, yeah. And, the, yeah. and, and but that leaves out, out what the Wobblies knew, which was that the very basis of that state's power, the class basis of the state power, had to be overcome. Exactly, right. it leaves, it, 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 it it assumes that somehow class can be massaged out of existence by basically, uh, you know, creating enough goodwilled people in positions of political, you know, authority. Uh, and mm-hmm. Cannon understood that to be, you know, a pipe dream and, and something that he was not interested in doing. So he went very quickly through the left wing of the Socialist Party and into the underground communist movement. Right. And and when was when was he involved with that? Because there's lots more to the story after that, right? I mean, he he was part of the underground movement, and then he did, he found that, that that was a limited path as well, right? So where did he go from there? Well, as he's in the underground communist movement, and as he, and as he's making himself into a different kind of revolutionary, a revolutionary that. Uh, both appreciates the significance of the Russian Revolution, appreciates the vital importance of a program of class struggle, uh, and appreciates the necessity of, you know, organizing workers in ways that bring these questions to the fore. As he's doing that, um, you know, what Cannon is also coming into, into a clash with is what the underground communist movement was. Largely, it was composed of European immigrants from very oppressive autocratic European regimes, almost mm. uh, post-feudal, if you will, like mm. czarism in Russia. Much mm. of the underground uh, leadership of the communist movement in America in the period, say, 1918 to 1919, 20, mm. were Russians. They had experienced czarism and its repressive capacity. And they felt you needed to have a communist movement that was underground, clandestine, so that it would protect itself from the repression. Cannon understood, because he had his his finger on the pulse in some ways of the American working class, through both his upbringing and through his wobbly days, where he had kind of interacted with that American working class when it was mobilizing and in motion. He knew that for all the flaws and for all the, in some senses, fakery, if you will, of bourgeois democracy, it still had openings there for working class activism to actually engage above ground in legal activities, organizing unions, organizing political opposition parties, contacting workers and expanding the base of the revolutionary movement. Mm -hmm. He knew that if the workers movement in America, the communist workers movement in America 
remained underground and remained a captive of the leadership of the old Russian vanguardists, mm -hmm. it would never reach into and penetrate the American working class as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so he began to be, be, he began to sort of maneuver and work in the underground to try to develop uh, the notion that we have to break out of this clandestine underground existence. Um, it was so bad that an old comrade of his who would later become a major figure in American Stalinism, Earl Browder, who was from also from Kansas City, Cannon and he had edited uh, a revolutionary newspaper, The Worker's World, uh, in 1919. Mm -hmm. Cannon had gone to New York to be part of the this underground. Browder came, and the underground was so deep and subterranean Mm -hmm. That Browder couldn't even find his old comrade Cannon. Took him weeks oh. to even connect with him mm -hmm. because there were these underground cells that were separated from one another and that were operating like they were in Tsarist Russia in the 1880s or 1890s. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Cannon worked with uh, you know revolutionary socialists of the left wing, Jews, Russians, Lats, Latvians, Finns, uh, and he. He was the leading figure by 1920, 21, uh, advocating to move uh, the revolutionary movement above ground. And from this, he received support and endorsement of the early Bolsheviks in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, Lenin read, read one of these underground documents and, and, and newspapers and scrawled on its side, on its margins, stop this nonsense. <laughs> Okay. I mean, he, he understood that American democracy, mm -hmm. whatever its failures, had potential for workers to actually work uh, and communists to work above ground and to create a large revolutionary movement. And without that, you were never going to transform the social order. Yeah. I mean, we had formal freedoms even back then. Yes. You know, and why, why pretend otherwise? Uh, when you're organizing for uh, a, a political and radical change. But um, so where did, so was that the point where Cannon, when he was breaking away from the Russians who were immigrants in America, the, the, the vanguardists that were there, uh, did that, is that when he started to get some uh, material support from the Soviet Union what, through some other organization? Uh, how big of a role did, the common turn play in uh, Cannon's development politically in the United States? Well, it, it, I think it played a vital and important role, and he himself would have acknowledged this. Uh, mm -hmm. He ended up going to uh, Russia in the early 20s uh, on more than one occasion. And he, he, when there, he met with major leaders like Zinoviev, uh, and uh, and they were supportive of the need to break out of the sort of straitjacket of the of the underground. It's not. What to organization say that, was was Cannon with when he went to to Russia? Who was he, uh, he was with an organization? Uh, uh, well, he he had led this movement of the mm -hmm. underground, and he was he 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 actually chaired the founding convention of the first legal uh, communist party in the States. It was known okay. as, then as, the, as the Workers' Party in 1921. Okay. And it was really, and however, as that was successful, it also, it faced the constant opposition of undergroundists who still remained underground and wanted to continue that process. And it's in that period from 1921 to 1923 or so, Mm -hmm. That Cannon makes some trips to the Soviet Union. He's he's connected to the the fig figures in the Communist International, and they are backing his position for the necessity of an above ground legal party. And again, it's a transition, it's an evolution, but by the mid nineteen twenties, that uh, that uh, uh, that the, the above ground party has won out. Now, what was going on in the Soviet Union at this time? Because this is around the period where Stalin, in around 22, I think, starts to have more of a role in the Bolshevik government. 
Um, is that is that right? I mean, when when did how did how what was what were the battles going on in the Soviet Union that and did they I mean, they had not developed a strategy of just trying to hold on to socialism in one country in 1921 and 1922. That that was down the road. Right. No. So, so what was what was the strategy in this in the Soviet Union to help foment uh, what would be an internationalist uh, revolution? Well, I, th- I think that uh, um, uh, there's there's two things that are, or at least that are going on. The first is that the Soviet Union is emerging out of uh, the period of war communism, uh, mm-hmm. World War One, and and facing the hostile uh, reception of the of the world's capitalist powers. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's battling really; it's hanging on by its fingernails. Mm-hmm. Um, and secondly, uh, as that's going on, they are trying. The Communist International is trying to uh, foment the the uh, the notion of of world revolution, and it's supporting revolutionary movements in Germany and elsewhere. But those revolutions don't come to fruition; they get repressed and defeated. Mm-hmm. And that is a conservatizing force within the Comintern. Because those defeats, in some senses, set set the revolutionary Bolsheviks back on their heels. They expected a revolution in Germany. They thought this is the most advanced capitalist country. It has the most advanced workers' movement, trade unions, workers' clubs, socialist parties, etc. They hoped for and thought realistically that a revolution would happen there. It didn't. And by 1923, uh, again, it's a long process. You know. Um, Luxembourg, you, whom you mentioned, and and, and uh, um, uh, you know, and others are executed. Um, and, that was in nineteen nineteen that that yes. they were executed. Yeah, and 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 again, this is part of the setback. But the, 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 the there's a there's a revolutionary uh, potential in nineteen twenty three that is also snuffed out. Mm. So that's going on. That kind of is conservatizing at the same point that that's happening. Lenin is very sick and dying. Mm. And he dies very early, I think, in 1924. Mm. Um, it's in this, it's in this, uh, in some senses, uh, conservatizing and constrained context in which the revolution is facing setback after setback that Stalin begins his upward climb uh, mm. within the kind of ladder or hierarchy of the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And he's drawing to him more conservative and more bureaucratic elements that are being ensconced in positions of authority. Trotsky is in this process, and, and Lenin's death is critical here. And, and Stalin, once, he, once Lenin dies, moves more, uh, even more quickly and more adroitly to concentrate power. And mm-hmm. part of that process is marginalizing uh, and, uh, and isolating Trotsky. What, what was Trotsky doing at that moment? I mean, was he aware of the threat that Stalin posed to the revolution and to his own position within the Bolsheviks uh, I, in 1924? I think he was always aware of this, uh, but um, he was perhaps unaware of just how devastating the impact of Stalin would be, ultimately. I mean, I'm talking... 23, 24, 25 now. Yeah, right, right. You know, uh, by 28, huh, he, he has a much firmer, you know, sense of... Did, did know, Trotsky that. want the kind of authority and power that Stalin was seeking? Did he want to be the person that would I think he absolutely lead? did not. Uh, and in fact, he, um, he did not engage in an all-out fight with Stalin. Uh early on in, in 24 or so that uh, um, in some senses was both merited and might have uh, um, rallied significant forces to Trotsky's uh, um, support. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think he did not seek the power at that time. Um, mm-hmm. And also uh, there was the, there was an, there was the ugly and unfortunate reality of anti-Semitism emerging with Stalin. 
Mm-hmm. And I think Trotsky backed off, in some senses, an all-out fight with Stalin very early on, in part because he did not want to inflame that, anti- that, that anti-Semitism. He thought that Stalin would play that card and that Trotsky would be depicted as, you know, the, the grasping Jew looking to, you know, uh, hold power. And there still remained a lot of residual anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union among mm. peasants, workers, and even, you know, party figures. Um, so uh, for a variety of reasons, Trotsky did not engage in, the, in, a, in an all-out fight. And mm. in fact, uh, I think this, this gave Stalin, in some senses, room to consolidate. Uh, and, you know, Stalin... Uh, if you you know Trotsky was the better revolutionary, but Stalin was the better bureaucrat. Mm-hmm. How did Cannon interpret what was happening in the Soviet Union when he visited? Uh, did he did he was he aware of the internal struggle and the conservatizing influence of Stalin at the, in that moment, or was he just focused on you know trying to get the revolutionaries in America to put their heads up? Uh, from underground and and do various other things more the latter yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, Cannon's I think Cannon's internationalism has been understated by many of his critics mm-hmm. uh, you know in, in the left historically and in the Trotskyist uh, in the various factions of Trotskyism uh, um, up to the modern period Um I think there was he, he had more of an international sensibility than many give him credit for, but his strength really was not that. And he relied on others and comrades in his party who spoke more foreign languages, uh, who may have had a, a better beat on international developments. He was more inclined to try to get from the early Bolshevik leaders what he could in terms of guidance and support and insight. And then apply those to what what was always his primary project, which was the mm-hmm. making of the American Revolution. And so, for much of the early to mid, and even into into the into the early stages of the late 1920s, Cannon avoided confronting this question of Stalinism's consolidation. He voted in the American uh, um, uh, Central Committee, for instance, with the party again in resolutions that were anti-Trotsky. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I, I'd have to check, but I think around 1925-26. But and eventually he, he, he came to Trotsky, right? I mean, uh, and and what was the confluence of factors that led him to do that? I mean, what what did Trotskyism or Trotsky offer the American struggle that he thought was needed and also what was he seeing in the Soviet Union and in Trotsky's own writing, I guess, that made him more committed to that as the revolutionary yep. trajectory. Okay. If I could back up just a bit yeah, okay. um, to contextualize this mm-hmm. over the course of the uh, mid uh, let's say the, the period 1923 to 1926, 27, uh, as the, the common turn is being Stalinized in those years. Mm-hmm. Cannon doesn't really understand this. He doesn't grasp it. He still has an incredible uh, um, loyalty to the communist international and to the Russian revolution. Uh, but what he sees going on in the United States is, the, is, the, is that the communist party in these years in the U.S., is impaled on this debilitating factionalism. Mm. A part of that is fomented, ironically, for Cannon, by agents sent into the American party by the Stalinized Comintern, including a major uh, antagonist of Cannon's, a guy named John Pepper, a Hungarian. Mm. Now, the Communist Party becomes balkanized between there's three factions, a political faction, which is running the administration of the party headed by uh, Charles Ruthenberg and, and Jay Lovestone, a trade union faction headed by William Z. Foster, and an international labor defense faction run by Cannon. 
the way these factions, they're, they're in some senses, Stalin found these factions convenient. Because mm-hmm. in balkanizing the American leadership, no one individual could become dominant to the point that he might actually get to the point of thinking through what was going on in the Soviet Union and presenting a kind of, you know, pole of strength and attraction for the American party, which was a very significant party in terms of the size of, 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 of communist parties, much, much larger than the British party, for instance. Yeah. I mean, just to imagine this at, a, in a, at to the maximal degree, if there had been something like a, a, a successful revolutionary struggle in America, a work, the working class really backing a communist party and engaging just just engaging in political struggle in America, that would have undermined Stalin's authority within the Comintern, right? I mean, it would have worked against Stalin's uh, consolidation of power. I think a strong party, a united party, and a party capable of actually exercising an influence in the leading industrial capitalist nation of the world undoubtedly would have posed challenges to Stalin that he really didn't want to deal with. So what Cannon was experiencing... Which, just to underline this, that makes Stalin almost consciously an anti-revolutionary. Well... Uh, right, you know, a counter-revolutionary this, force. <laughs> this would right. be ultimately Trotsky's realization. Took, yeah. took him and Cannon a long time to get there. But right. by the mid-1930s, by the mid that was the realization. But the, 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 uh, the point for Cannon in the 20s is that he didn't understand what was going on internationally. What he could see and what he could feel and what he lived was, in effect, the, in some senses, the, uh, the, the destruction of the potential of Communist Party in this factionalized environment. And he grew very uh, disillusioned and despairing to the point that when his that he, he tried, first of all, to overcome it by building what he called a faction against factionalism. In which he said to his followers, we are no longer voting as a factional bloc. We are we are going to vote with other uh, uh, Communist Party members when they have a position that we ascertain is the right position. We're going to mm. try to step outside of our, our own factional skins and show others that this can be done. That proved, you know, something of an impossibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, by 1928, when the Sixth Congress of the Communist International is being called and held, Cannon has gone through all kinds of experiences to deepen this disillusionment, including in 1926 or 27, an American Communist Party conference to to actually establish a leadership, seeing it's it's seeing the leadership that was supposed to go to William Z. Foster be overturned by uh, basically a, a Stalinist agent on the ground uh, uh, in Chicago who read a cable from. Uh, a telegram from Moscow that said, well, Foster lacks this and this and Lovestone lacks this and this. And so we're going to have this and this be the, the actual configuration of the party leadership. Mm. The joke that, that, w- that went around the, the, the Communist Party circles in this period was, why is the Communist Party like the Brooklyn Bridge? Because, it's, suspend- because it's suspended on cables. <laughs> yeah. It's waiting for these cables from Moscow. Cannon found this repugnant. His own faction pressed him to go to uh, the Sixth Congress in 1928. And he wasn't going to go. He was mm. going to retreat in some senses into his administrative job running the International Labor Defense Organization. Mm. And he had basically, in some senses, given up the ghost of the of the of the American Party, uh, being what he what he wanted it to be, what he what he really desired it to be. He dedicated his life to the revolution. He was a professional revolutionary. He wasn't going to throw it all over. But he he was he despaired that things were going to change. Mm. He went to Moscow. In 1928. 
And there, whether it was by chance or whether it was by purpose, he and a Canadian dissident communist named Morris Spector gained access because they sat on a certain committee to a document written by Trotsky, a draft program for the Communist International, which was a critique of Stalin's international policies and of this, you know, the turn to socialism in one country. Mm. And a, a big part of that critique, which resonated with Cannon, was his was Trotsky's attack on the Communist Party's uh, uh, leading role in trying to foment or develop a farmer labor party, a cross class party uh, that, in some senses, suppressed the revolutionary initiative of the working class, and you know merged. What was the it. name of this document again? A uh, draft program of the Communist International. Okay. And it critiqued what went on in China in 1926-27. It critiqued what went on, what the the role the Communist Party of Great Britain had played in the in the in the general strike in 1926. And it critiqued developments in the U.S. around the Farmer Labor Party. And as Cannon described it, suddenly a light went on. Mm -hmm. Suddenly he kind of saw, okay. This is like I understand now why things have been such a mess. Yeah. And but what was he going to do? If he came out publicly in Moscow embracing and endorsing this document, he inspector would have been well they might have even been detained there. They might never yeah. have gotten out of the Soviet Union. Right. Uh, you know, this was the beginnings of Stalin's more, uh, um, uh, how should I put it, uh, repressive onslaught against the left. Mm -hmm. um, and so Cannon and Specter decided to uh, keep their views secret, mm -hmm. smuggle the document back to North America, where they could show it to other comrades and where they could perhaps win people over. Their idea was still that the Communist Party contained the most advanced segments of the North American working class. And what was needed was them to see the, see this document so that the lights could go on in their heads mm -hmm. and they could be won back to the revolutionary uh, principles and program that had animated the Russian Revolution and that had really given birth to the communist movement globally. Mm -hmm. um, so they did that. Uh, and that so that's that's the long story of how Ken yeah. came to see uh, Trotsky as uh, really uh, someone with whom he, he could ally. Well, you know, I, I'm noticing the time we've been talking for just about an hour. I hope you have more time. Uh, I've got I'd as like, much time as you need. I've great, that's great. That's great. Need. What I usually do is I put an hour out for the public and then put another hour uh, up for patrons. In your case, what I'd like to do is do that, but then in, in a week after that, release the second half too, because I think this is a really interesting conversation that everybody should hear. But I'll I'll probably do that. So, starting from this point, though, we'll this I'll put a break here, and the second half for the first time it's, when it's released originally will be for patrons, because this is the part that matters. This is the part <laughs> about Trotsky. I mean, it's not the only part that matters. All of it matters, but this is where we're getting into the to the meat of of. Uh, what you've been writing about and uh, the history of canon, because this is where he, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I've read some interviews.